Chapter 16 of Life and Times of Joseph Warren by Richard Frothingham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Closing Scene Warren and the 17th of June The Committee of Safety The Continental Congress Warren in the Bunker Hill Battle His Fall The General Grief The Remains Monument Conclusion 1775, the 17th of June The 17th of June was a marked anniversary in Warren's career. Seven years before, on this day, in a town meeting, he recommended the people to vindicate their rights at the hazard of fortune and life. On the last anniversary, acting still more prominently as a popular leader, his morning hours were full of anxiety because, for the first time, he had to meet an exigency without the guidance of Samuel Adams. But, in the evening, he was full of joy because of the success of a town meeting, the choice of delegates to a Continental Congress, and the signs that heralded American Union. Warren may be said to have lived in age during the twelve months upon which he then entered. There soon happened those exigencies that occur in the progress of great events, in meeting which mediocrity too often fails, but genuine ability rises to the mark of rendering large public service. Warren, growing steadily in self-reliance, discharged the duties which fell to his lot in such a manner that his contemporaries said, he filled each of the numerous departments of life that were assigned to him so well that he seemed born for no other, and that his name would live and fill the world with wonder. His words, as he thus acted, show how his spirit linked itself with the heroic and memorable past of the ages, and yet how simply and tersely he could urge the practical duties of the hour. Though he was an enthusiast for liberty, he appreciated the necessity of joining to it that respect which power only can command. His ideal was liberty without licentiousness. He urged for its full enjoyment the formation of a just government, based on the will and sustained by the power of the people and clothed with adequate authority to cover the rights of person and property with the aegis of law. His last utterances, private and official, plead for such a crowning to the patriot cause. He urged that the Continental Congress should authorize the formation of a local government and transform, by adoption, the raw militia around him into a national army. On this last morning of his life, he did not know that Congress had given its advice to Massachusetts and appointed a commander-in-chief. He passed the night of the 16th of June at Watertown, where the Provincial Congress held its sessions, but the journal of the proceedings of this day shows that he was not present at the meeting on the morning of the 17th, for it is recorded of the first item of business, the report was ordered to lie on the table till the President came into Congress. He had declared his intention to share the peril of the day with his countrymen, when an intimate friend, Elbridge Jerry, who had been his roommate, entreated him not to expose a life so valuable with something like a presentiment, he replied, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is sweet and becoming to die for the country. And hence, a patriot wrote, The ardor of dear Dr. Warren could not be restrained by the entreaty of his brethren of the Congress. It may be sufficient as to motive to say that the same ardor which, for the sake of the cause, had moved him to go where duty was to be performed, which carried him to Lexington, Grape Island, and Noddles Island, prompted his course on this memorable day. But it was also a mark of sound judgment. He had fully resolved that his future service should be in the military line. Confidence by an army and a commander is a vital element of success and this can be acquired only on the field. Acting, doubtless, with the fixedness of aim which characterized his whole life, he left Watertown early in the morning with a view of making himself useful and went to Cambridge. The Committee of Safety held its sessions in the Hastings House, on Cambridge Common, in which General Ward had his headquarters, and Warren met with them. The calls on this body for cannon, horses, powder, reinforcements, 
the pressing orders in its journal for the towns to act, and short and hurried notes attest the thrilling interest of the hour. The intelligence from Colonel Prescott was so decisive that the British were preparing to move out of Boston and assault his works that the committee urged General Ward to send forward additional force to Charlestown, and about 11 o'clock, before General Howe landed in this town, Ward issued orders for more troops to march to the support of Colonel Prescott. As the armies were making preparations for a battle, letters arrived from Philadelphia, brought express by Mr. Fessenden, signed by John Hancock, the President, and Charles Thompson, the Secretary of the Continental Congress. They contained the great news, which was ordered to be kept secret, that the Congress had ordered purchases of saltpeter, sulfur, powder, and 5,000 barrels of flour for the use of the Continental Army, which were to be paid for out of the Continental funds, and also that it had recommended the people of Massachusetts to form a local government. It was another advance towards nationality. Warren probably opened these letters and forwarded them to the Provincial Congress. They were read in the afternoon session. Would that Warren could also have known that a commander-in-chief had been appointed and that, as he desired, the choice had fallen on Washington. Between twelve and one o'clock, a horseman rode furiously into Cambridge with the report that the regulars had landed at Charlestown, when the bells were rung, the drums beat to arms, and there were the confusion and hurry incident to an ill-disciplined soldiery, for the camp, except where Putnam's and Warren's influence had their effects, was in a confused condition. General Putnam had come from Bunker Hill, and he promptly ordered the remainder of his regiment to Charlestown, but the course of General Ward was regarded as hesitating and inefficient, and elicited severe contemporary comment. He did not leave his house the whole day. It is not necessary, however, to relate the details of the events of the battle scene that ensued, but only to glance at a few points in order to show the circumstances under which Warren acted. It was a very hot summer's day, with a burning sun. Warren was suffering from a nervous headache and threw himself on a bed, but after the alarm was given, he rose and, saying that his headache was gone, started for the scene of action. It is said that one of his students, Dr. Townsend, accompanied him a part of the way on foot, but that, a short distance from the college, Warren was on horseback. He overtook two friends who were walking to the battlefield, and exchanging with them the usual salutations, he passed along towards Charlestown. He came within range of the British batteries at the low, flat ground which marks the entrance to that portion of the town nearest to Boston, which is a peninsula, and the firing, at the time he passed, between two and three o'clock, must have been severe. He went up Bunker Hill, where another of his students, William Eustace, served on this day as a surgeon. Here Warren had a view of the whole situation. On his left was Mystic River, where there were no floating batteries. The line of fire from the British began on a point a little inclined to the left, where the ships of war, Lively, and the Falcon lay, and it continued round by Charles River from Copse Hill, the Somerset, the Cerebus, the Glasgow, the Symmetry Transport, and two floating batteries quite to his right. He could see, on the side of Bunker Hill towards Boston, the protection which Captain Knowlton began to construct of the rail fences when Colonel Prescott ordered him from the redoubt to oppose the enemy's right wing, and which the New Hampshire forces, under Colonel Stark and Reed, were extending. Directly in front of the rail fence, on a small hill at Moulton's Point, he could see the same British regiment which he had beheld so long in Boston, among them, doubtless, the officers before whom he delivered his 5th of March oration, now awaiting the order for an assault. The furious cannonade about this time was directed upon Roxbury to occupy the attention of the provincials in that quarter, while the fire of three ships, three batteries, several field pieces, and a battery on Copse Hill from six different directions centered on the entrenchments. Warren went to the rail fence. Here he was on foot. He met General Putnam, who, it is said, offered to receive orders from Warren, who replied, I am only here as a volunteer. 
I know nothing of your dispositions, nor will I interfere with them. Tell me where I can be most useful. Putnam directed him to the redoubt with the remark, There you will be covered, when Warren said, Don't think I came to seek a place of safety, but tell me where the onset will be most furious. General Putnam again named the redoubt. Warren then went forward to Breed's Hill and into the redoubt. There was a feeling at this time, in the ranks at this post, so manifest was the peril, that, through the oversight, presumption, or treachery of the officers, the men would all be slain. They needed encouragement. Warren was enthusiastically received. All the men huzzahed. He said that he came to encourage a good cause, and that a reinforcement of 2,000 men was on its way to their support. Colonel Prescott asked the general if he had any orders to give. Warren replied that he had none, and exercised no command, saying, The command is yours. This is the relation by General Heath. Judge Prescott, who heard the fact from his father, the colonel, is more circumstantial in relating the incident. General Warren, Judge Prescott says, came to the redoubt a short time before the action commenced with a musket in his hand. Colonel Prescott went to him and proposed that he should take the command, observing that he, Prescott, understood he, Warren, had been appointed a major general a day or two before by the Provincial Congress. General Warren replied, I shall take no command here. I have not yet received my commission. I came as a volunteer with my musket to serve under you, and shall be happy to learn from a soldier of your experience." Warren undoubtedly served as a volunteer in the battle that, that began soon after he arrived. It continued, including the two intermissions, about an hour and a half. The town of Charlestown was set on fire in several places by order of the British general, and it was one great blaze. The roofs of Boston and the hills round the country were covered with spectators, and these features, with the work of the battle made the whole a picture and a complication of horror and importance. On such a field, Warren fought a good fight. He was applied to for orders and gave them. Regardless of himself, his whole soul seemed to be filled with the greatness of the cause he was engaged in, and, while his friends were dropping away all around him, he gave his orders with a surprising coolness. His character and conduct and presence greatly animated and encouraged his countrymen. His heroic soul elicited a kindred fire from the troops. His lofty spirit gave them confidence. He performed many feats of bravery and exhibited a coolness and conduct which did honor to the judgment of his country in appointing him a major general. The British general was baffled in his flanking design of forcing the rail fence and of surrounding the redoubt. His troops met gallantly the line of fire poured upon them, but they were twice compelled to fall back. On the third advance, they stormed the redoubt and the breastwork connected with it when the ammunition of their defenders had failed. As the regulars, showing a forest of bayonets came over one side of the redoubt, the militia fell back to the other side, and there was a brief but fierce hand-to-hand -hand struggle when the butts of the muskets were used, and Warren was now seen for the last time by Colonel Prescott, who was not among those who ran out of the redoubt, but stepped long with his sword up, as he parried the thrusts that were made at his person. So great was the dust arising now from the dry, loose soil that the outlet was hardly visible. Warren was among the last to go out. Just outside of it, there was much mingling of the British and provincials and great confusion when the firing for a few moments was checked. At this time, Warren endeavored to rally the militia, a contemporary account says, sword in hand. He was recognized by a British officer who wrested a musket out of a soldier's hand and shot him. He fell about 60 yards from the redoubt, being struck by a bullet in the back part of his head on the right side. Having mechanically clapped his hand to the wound, he dropped down dead. The retreating and the pursuing throng passed on by his body. The rail fence had not been forced, and its brave defenders protected their brethren of the redoubt as they retreated from the peninsula. The victors did not continue their pursuit beyond Bunker Hill. On the following Sunday morning, Dr. John Warren, who was in Salem on the day previous, 
went to Cambridge and received the distressing intelligence that his brother was missing. He inquired of almost every person he saw for information of the general. Some said that he was alive and well, others that he was wounded, and others that he fell on the field. In this manner, several days were passed, each day's information diminishing the probability of his safety. On Monday, the Provincial Congress elected a president in the room of the Honorable Joseph Warren Esquire, supposed to be killed in the late battle. Meantime, on Sunday morning, John Winslow of Boston, subsequently General Winslow, went over the battlefield and recognized the body of Warren among the dead. His hand was bloody and it was under his head. Dr. Jeffries also is said to have recognized it. He was buried on the field. It was reported in the American camp that his body was stripped, that it was dug up several times to gratify the curiosity of those who came to see it, and that his coat was sold by a soldier in Boston. There are several other relations, American and British, of the death of Warren. I select a few of them. Amos Foster says, I saw General Warren. His clothes were bloody when he cried out to us, I am a dead man. Fight on, my brave fellows, for the salvation of your country. Samuel Lawrence says, I saw General Warren shot. I saw him when the ball struck him, and from that time until he expired. The following are British accounts. The celebrated Dr. Warren who commanded in the provincial trenches at Charlestown while he was bravely defending himself against several opposing regulars, was killed in a cowardly manner by an officer's servant, but the fellow was instantly cut to pieces. Six letters were found in the doctor's pocket, written from some gentlemen in Boston, who were immediately taken into custody. At this time, Warren, there, the provincial's commander, fell, he was a physician, little more than 30 years of age. He died in his best clothes. Everybody remembered his fine, silk-fringed waistcoat. The unhappy leader in the fatal action of Charlestown, who from ambition only had raised himself from a bare-legged milk boy to a major general of the army, although the fatal ball gave him not a moment for reflection, Yet he said in his lifetime that he was determined to mount over the heads of his co-adjutors and get to the last round of the ladder or die in the attempt. Unhappy man. His fate arrested him in his career, and he can now tell whether pride and ambition are pillars strong enough to support the tottering fabric of rebellion. Warren's death cast a gloom over the land. Whether friend or foe, the generous, the elegant, and the humane, all, all mingled the sympathetic tear. The general grief attests the hold which he had on the affection of his countrymen. I select a few independent contemporary expressions. Here fell our worthy and much lamented friend, Dr. Warren, with as much glory as Wolf on the plains of Abraham at once admired and lamented in such a manner as to make it difficult to determine whether regret or envy predominates. The loss of Dr. Warren is irreparable. His death is generally and greatly lamented, but dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. This is a day of heroes. The fall of one will inspire the surviving glorious band to emulate his virtues and revenge his death on the foes of liberty in our country. We have yet about 60 or 70 killed or missing, but among these is, what shall I say? How shall I write the name of our worthy friend, the great and good Dr. Warren? The tears of multitudes pay tribute to his memory. Not all the havoc and devastation they, the British, have made has wounded me like the death of Warren. We want him in the Senate. We want him in his profession. We want him in the field. We mourn for the citizen, the senator, the physician, and the warrior. When he fell... Liberty wept. He closed a life of glory in a glorious death, and heaven never received the spirit of a purer patriot. The death, Samuel Adams wrote to his wife, of our truly amiable and worthy friend, Dr. Warren, is greatly afflicting. The language of our friendship is, how shall we resign him? But it is our duty to submit to the dispensations of heaven, whose ways are ever gracious 
ever just. He fell in the glorious struggle for public liberty. And Arthur Lee, while abroad in anticipating the meeting of friends, wrote, Would to God we could number worn among them, and that it had been permitted him to see the beauties of that fabric which he labored with so much zeal and ability to rear. His saltum accumulum donis et furgeri ineni munere. In just nine months after the Battle of Bunker Hill, the victors were compelled to yield the possession of it to Washington. Four days later, on the 21st of March, 1776, Dr. John Warren went over the field on which his brother slept in a soldier's grave. The hill, he wrote, commands the most affecting view I ever saw. The walls of magnificent buildings, tottering to the earth below, above a great number of rude hillocks, under which were deposited the remains, in clusters, of those deathless heroes who fell in the field of battle. The scene was inexpressibly solemn, when I considered that, perhaps, whilst I was musing on the objects round me, I might be standing over the remains of a dear brother whose blood had stained these hallowed walks. Several days passed before the body of Warren was found. The Rosemary and Cassia, Governor Gore says, adorned and discovered his hallowed grave. It was identified on the 4th of April, covered with about three feet of ground, much disfigured, yet it was sufficiently known by two artificial teeth which were set for him a short time before his glorious exit. On the same day, Honorable James Sullivan, by order of a committee of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, who had been appointed to erect a monument to his memory, reported that the Lodge of Freemasons, of which he was late Grand Master, were desirous of taking up his remains and burying them with the customary solemnities of the craft, and that Warren's friends consented to the proposition. The committee recommended that the Lodge have leave to carry out their intention, in such manner as that the government of the colony might hereafter have an opportunity to erect a monument to the memory of that worthy, valiant, and patriotic American. The remains, placed in an elegant coffin, were removed from the hill to the state or townhouse at the head of State Street. On Monday, the 8th of April, they were reinterred with as great respect, honor, and solemnity as the state of the town would permit, the New England Chronicle says. The procession began from the State House and consisted of a detachment of the Continental Forces, a numerous body of the Honorable Society of Free and Accepted Masons, of which fraternity the General was Grand Master throughout North America, the mourners, a number of the members of the two houses of the Honorable General Assembly, the selectmen and inhabitants of the town. The pall was supported by the Honorable General Ward, Brigadier General Fry, Dr. Morgan, Colonel Gridley, the Honorable Mr. Gill, and J. Scully, Esquire. The corpse was carried into King's Chapel, where the Reverend Dr. Cooper made a very pertinent prayer on the occasion after which Perez Morton Esquire pronounced an ingenious and spirited oration. This production contains a warm panegyric on Warren's private and public life. At its conclusion, the orator advocated independence. Shall we, his words are, still contend for a connection with those who have forfeited not only every kindred claim, but even their title to humanity? Forbid it, the spirit of the brave Montgomery. Forbid it, the spirit of the immortal Warren. Forbid it, the spirits of all our valiant countrymen, who fought, bled, and died for far different purposes. They contended for the establishment of peace, liberty, and safety to their country, and we are unworthy to be called their countrymen if we stop at any acquisition short of this. The remains were deposited in the tomb of George Richards Minot, a friend of the family. Nearly half a century afterwards, in 1825, when those who took part in these ceremonies had died and the place of deposit had become unknown, the relics were discovered in the Minot tomb in the granary burying ground. They were identified by the nephew of the general, Dr. John C. Warren, by the eye tooth and the mark of the fatal bullet behind the left ear. 
They were placed in a box of hardwood and removed to the worn tomb in St. Paul's Church, Boston. The box bears a silver plate with the following inscription. In this tomb are deposited the earthly remains of Major General Joseph Warren, who was killed in the Battle of Bunker Hill on June 17, 1775. They are now in the Forest Hill Cemetery. I have aimed to trace faithfully the career of Joseph Warren. It is characterized by rare singleness of aim. He grasped, as by intuition, the ideas that are fundamental and vital, and he sought by applying them to promote the good of his country. He was a type of American nationality, as it rose to grasp liberty and union. He loved this cause more than he loved his life, and he was ever ready to peril his all in its behalf. He evinced a sound judgment, had clear conceptions of political questions, and was animated by patriotic motives. His integrity, capacity for public service, talent for writing, fervid eloquence, cool courage, promptitude of action, large love for his countrymen, and commanding genius endowed him with the magic spell of influence, and the power there is in a noble character. His utterances and his work constitute an enduring memorial of his fame. He was not permitted, like many co-patriots, to live long and, after the enjoyment of tokens of public confidence, to witness in coming days the greatness of the structure of which he did so much to lay the foundation, but he was destined to fall, ere he saw the star of his country rise, and even in his death to benefit the cause which it was his ruling passion to promote. He dwells in memory as the young, brave, blooming, generous, self-devoted martyr, awakening the purifying emotions of admiration, tenderness, and love of the country. The influence of such a character is not confined to contemporaries. As the Friends of Liberty from all countries and throughout all time contemplate it, they may feel their better feelings strengthened and gather from it a kindred virtue. End of chapter 16